Can I? I don't know. I just feel like there's liberty right here. And I think we just need to stand to our feet and give God a shout. Give him praise just for a minute. God is good. You're from, hallelujah. Give him praise. Glory to your name, Lord God. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's go again. Come on. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Worthy are you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Woo. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. You can be seated. So I'm going to talk to you about revival. <laughs> Revival. I believe God's already stirring it, don't you? I sense it in my bones, in my spirit, I sense it. That God, we're right now in the preparation stage that God is preparing a people for revival. But we got to know what revival is, what we're really seeking, and what it is that we're asking God to, to pour out on us. How many people have prayed for revival in the past? How many people have actually seen what you prayed for? <laughs> Not, maybe a little bit, maybe some, maybe part of the reason is we didn't really know what we were praying for. Didn't know what we were asking for. Because a lot of times what we, we, uh, we, we identify or, or give definitions to words based on what we've seen in the past. So in the past, what I saw revival being was in the church I grew up in, we had one in the spring and we had one in the fall. It was scheduled. It was a week. It started usually on Sunday night or Monday morning or, or Monday evening and went through Friday or Saturday night. You bring in a, a visiting kind of evangelist, somebody that's full of fire and charismatic and, and got you all fired up. Sometimes there was somebody got saved in the community. That was pretty incredible. That was awesome. But for the most part, it was a stirring and, you know, people in the church getting, uh, rededicating their lives, um, getting pumped up and uh, getting excited. And, and it kind of stirred within the members of the church. It kind of, usually you, your attendance went up at least for a few weeks, you know, because people began to come, you know, that, that hadn't been coming on a regular basis. So they began to come. And, uh, and, and, but the sad part about it, what I witnessed and what I saw over all those years is that after two or three weeks, it just began to go right back down to where it was. So I want to look at what is revival and what is it that we're seeking God for? So you could actually have an increase in attendance and it not be a revival. You could have a, an excitement in the church and it not be revival. You could actually, you know, because we get pumped up a little bit and start talking to our neighbors and our friends uh, and uh, inviting them to come to church and they get saved, you know, actually getting somebody, leading somebody to the Lord is not revival. You could almost, if you're not careful, do more harm than you do good for the church uh, by just stirring up some excitement and, uh, and getting people pumped up, but not really changed. See, well, one thing I want to point out, and I'm really not following my notes, so I'll probably get it all messed up here in a minute. But I'll start somewhere and try to, I'll probably hit some of this again. But one of the things I want to make sure we understand is, you know, the fastest, if attendance defines a revival, then the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. Well, we know that's not a true even religion. So that's not revival. If it's based on people, these people get excited. It's growing. The numbers are being added to uh, quickly all over the world. They're willing, they're so excited that they're willing to strap bombs on their back and die for the cause. But that's not revival. 
See, we got to understand that just excitement and enthusiasm and, and uh, increase in numbers is not revival. Revival, like we've talked in the past, starts in you and in me. Revival is not really about the lost getting saved. Revival is about the saved getting restored to where they ought to be. To their walk with the Lord that God intended. A corporate revival will not be or happen until an individual revival happens. It starts in you and in I. If we really want a revival in this church, in the art church, it starts in you. You have to be revived. The word revive in Hebrew means to recover, to repair, to restore, to be complete again, and to return to the intended plan of God. Revival means to regain life or strength to become active or flourishing again revival is a restoration of God's plan for your life and is a return to God's intended ways it's a return to what God originally planned for mankind that we would walk with him that we would talk with him on a daily basis not just a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening but we put God at the forefront of our life and we commune with him we talk to him we 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 come before him continually throughout the day we acknowledge his presence in our life on a on an every minute basis almost so we're walking with God revival is the people of God returning to the original plan that God had for you to walk with you to talk with you to be with you to be your God and you to be his people. Making, or revival is making alive again those who have been alive, or in other words, Christians. It's reviving those that have once been alive with him, and it seems like have just kind of faded away. It's reviving them back to God's intended plan. It may be seeking, see, revival is restoring the things that has separated us from God's plan. It's a return to walking with God. It's a, revival is a return to the proper relationship that God intends between he and you, you and I. It's not a special week-long service that we plan and pray that God would bless. It is not going to a special service or a conference that, that gets us all excited and pumped up and then watching it slowly fade away over the next few weeks. Revival is to be a lifelong thing, not be a one week thing, but to be a, it's a change in our lives that happens when we seek after God and, and, and we're changed from that point on. Revival comes when we're convicted by the Holy Spirit of God of things that are coming between us and the Lord. True revival comes when we're changed by allowing the Holy Spirit to permanently transform our lives. There are many things that can separate us from God's original plan for us. It may be seeking after worldly things, it may be disobedience to God, things that you know God has told you, and yet we disobey. It may be pride or arrogance over even successes we've had with God in the past. Or it may be just willful rebellion against God and thinking that nobody will know. We can just do these things, be disobedient to God, and nobody's going to know the difference because God does know. If we truly want revival, a revival that repairs what is broken, that restores us to God's intended plan, and makes whole the people of God, it must come from repentance of sin, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, and the removal of sin from the camp. Now let me just say that one more time, because this is, if we truly want revival, 
It's going to come when we are convicted, when we come before the Lord, and we're convicted of sin. We repent of that sin, and we remove that sin from our lives. That's when revival can begin. Isn't it amazing how God can and will use things in your life to kind of teach you, to show you? God, I, you know, God's been teaching me and showing me what revival is. This past week, not this week, but the week before, I changed my medical doctor. Not because I was unhappy with the treatment that I was receiving or the care I felt like I was getting, but because Teresa and I both decided that we needed a doctor that would focus on the root of the problem and not just treat the symptom. So I, what I found through the last several weeks of, of doctors and, and you know, sickness and so forth is that doctors typically, or what I'm, at least for the most part, what I'm finding is they just treat a symptom. You come in with a cough, they give you a cough drop. You come in with sore throat, they give you something for the sore throat. Not to really heal it most of the time, just to make it feel better. Well, see, as Christians, we're kind of dry. We, we're doing it. Much of the church is doing the same thing. Instead of really going to the root of the problem, what's causing us to be separated from God's original plan and intent for, for his people, and we're just trying to treat it. We're just trying to make us feel better about it. We're, we can have, we can bring in, you know, charismatic speakers we can go to conferences we can start all kinds of programs we can do all these things that will fill chairs but is it changing anything are we truly returning are we being changed are we truly going getting back to the place that God intends with for for me to be or am I truly beginning to be changed repenting of my sin and, and dealing with the sin that's in my life and then seeking God for a closer walk with him. See, the problem, the root of the problem that most churches are facing, including, I will even just say us, if we're not walking close with the Lord on a 24-7 basis, the problem is sin. That's the root of the problem. So we have to, you know, I feel like I'm this doctor up here this morning say, listen, let's get to the root of it. Let's deal with this thing and not just put a Band-Aid on something and let it continue to get worse and fester and grip, get, get infected. Let's treat the symptom and then let's walk with God the way he's intended us to walk. So the thing I had to really ask myself laying there in the hospital is am I going to continue to live and do the things I've been doing or am I going to allow the doctor am I actually going to take his advice and do what he tells me to do and 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 treat the problem or am I just going to try to feel a little better and then go on about my life and and do the same old things that'll ultimately get me right back to the same place so as a church, we got to decide the same thing. Are we going to just try to, you know, treat some symptoms? Or are we going to listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and do what he says to do and be changed? If I want change in my spiritual life, in my walk with the Lord, then I got to admit that I've got a problem, first of all. I got to admit that I'm a sinner. That I've got sin that needs to be dealt with. I need to repent before the Lord and actually do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do to get it out of my life. We can pray for revival. We can bring in entertaining worship. We can bring in motivational speakers. We can attend conferences. But if we're not careful, these are simply treating the symptoms of our sin. Or... We can, by the help of the Holy Spirit, get to the root of the problem, which is sin, and deal with it. We could focus on growing in numbers. We could add programs that would help us grow in numbers. But what we truly, really need is the Holy Spirit to convict us. And then we need to 
repent on what is hindering us from walking with God the way we should. Over the last few weeks, God has been really talking to us and convicting us about getting the sin out of the camp and returning to the agape love that we are to have for God and for one another. In Joshua chapter 6, I'm going to go to Joshua chapter 7, but I'm going to lead you up to Joshua chapter 7. And in chapter 6, the children of Israel have just crossed over the Jordan River. They, they went before the Lord. The Lord gave them instruction on how they're to do this. That, and before they just went charging across the river, they went before the Lord and said, give us instruction. Tell us how we're to do this, how we're supposed to go about doing this. The Lord gave them very specific instruction, and they followed that, that instruction, and they were very successful. They were blessed by God because they did what God told them to do. Now, in chapter 7, they're facing another hindrance to the promises of God that's blocking them from their intended purpose and promise of God. It's Jericho. Now here they are at Jericho. So they go again before the Lord and get God's specific instruction on how to address this enemy. See, isn't that such a thing that we, instead of just saying, well, I think we ought to do this. Let's go here. Let's do that. Let's, uh, and should, it, would we, should we not just go before the Lord and say, God, what should we do now? We're facing another hindrance, maybe in our walk with God. Instead of us just trying to, in our own mind and strength, deciding what we need to be doing as a church or in our individual lives, should we not just come before the Lord and say, God, how do we confront this mountain that's in front of us now? God, I'm sure if the children of Israel had done it in their own power, not sought God, well, they wouldn't have went to Jericho and started marching around the city seven for seven days. They would have just went and attacked and probably would have been defeated. But they got the instruction from the Lord that didn't even make sense in the natural, but yet it worked. God blessed it because they followed his instruction. So he, they received this detailed instruction concerning Jericho, and they began to do just as the Lord instructed, except for one person named Achan. One person had a big impact on what, was, what happened from there on. See, the Lord, I, as I was thinking about this, I wrote this down. I wrote it in big, bold letters, black, bold letters. I want to say this to you because the Lord spoke to me in this. Almost total obedience is disobedience. You can 99% get it right and not do one little thing that the Lord told you to do. And it's disobedience. Almost obedience separates you from God. That hurts. Look at Joshua chapter 7. Let's see what happens. Joshua chapter 7. I'm going to read this entire chapter, which is a little bit of reading, but I think it'll help us. Because what I want to see... It's what, I, what I'm looking at here is how we, how we deal with sin. How sin, as, as the body, as the family right here, how the sin of one affects us all. So we, let's read. <clears throat> so, so they've been to Jericho. The walls fail. And now they've got another, they're confronting another enemy. So let's see what happens. But the children of Israel committed a trespass against the accursed things for the one guy, Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho, and this is pronounced I, even though it says A-I, it's pronounced I, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them saying, go up and spy out the country. 
So notice here again, he, instead of going to the Lord, they sent people. They sent some of their soldiers and said, let's go check out and get a plan. This is one of their first mistakes here. Instead of, they, up to this point, they had sought God on what they should do and how they should do it. Now they're getting confident in their successes, which we have to be careful of, and began to do it in their own power. So, okay, so, so saying, go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out I. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not let all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack I. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of I are few. This is the direction of man, not the direction of God. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of I. And the men of I struck down about 36 men, killed 36 of the Israeli Jewish people, soldiers, for they chased them from before the gates as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Now let's look what Joshua does. Then Joshua tore his clothes and he fell to the earth on his, on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Look what Joshua begins to do. It's so disappointing in a way. Here, they haven't even sought the Lord. And then look how he comes belly aching and complaining and basically blaming God. He says, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? And he's like, why did you even bring us over here? Why did you do this to us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's all God's fault. And look, you're going to be, you're going to pay the price for it. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. I love that. Here he is laying in the floor praying, which you would think would be the right thing to do when we're kind of separated from God, crying out to God, blaming God, uh, you know, just belly aching. And God says, get up. Uh, you know, I, I feel like he said, I don't, I, I don't want to hear your prayers right now. He says, get up. Sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. I want you to notice something right here. Look how he's saying, how, who's accountable here? So he's saying in the morning, Therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come from the households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. So what I believe like the Lord is saying right here, our church, you come as a church. You come as a family. And, and individual families, and then you also come as the man of the family before the Lord. Because the man is responsible, but the entire family is responsible too. Let's see what he says. Okay, then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarites, and he brought the family of the Zarites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, 
I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I've done. Notice this, too. He says, When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, when I saw 200 shekels of silver, and when I saw, it doesn't say that every time, but I'm adding it to it because that's what he did, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. They took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Acre. In other words, outside the camp. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from it the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Acre to this very day. Thank you, Lord. So God told the children of Israel not to take of any of the accursed things. It was very plain. And Joshua told them as well what God had said. You're not to take anything. There's some things that are going to be set aside for, for worship. And then the rest of it is going to be burned and destroyed. Don't take it. Don't, be it. Don't touch it. Verse 1 of chapter 7 tells us that the children of Israel committed a trespass. So I find that interesting that Achan was one individual, but it's like the whole, God looked at the whole nation, the whole family. It says the, that the children of Israel committed a trespass because Achan, one individual, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel and they were defeated at Ai. Verse 6 tells us that Israel had, was defeated and Joshua tore his clothes, fell upon his face before the ark of the Lord and the elders with him and they were putting dust on their face, crying out, you know, probably hollering and screaming and carrying on. Just like the children of Israel, when we realize sometimes that our walk with the Lord has been hindered, we begin to cry out to the Lord. We start praying and begging God, maybe even to send revival, thinking that if we cry out loud enough, hard enough, and long enough, that it will persuade God to return his blessings to us. But instead of praying and crying out, God told Joshua in verse 10 to get up. So before we begin to pray and cry out to God to bless us, we need to confess our sin. We need to repent before the Lord and get the sin from among us. And we got to be changed. God said, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. Verse 13, the Lord says to get up, quit praying, and sanctify yourselves because there's an accursed thing in your midst. And you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. So first things first is what God's saying. There's an order that we got to get right before we just start praying for revival. First deal with the sin in our lives because we come, before we come begging and blaming God, for not blessing us. When sin is the problem, get up. Repent before the Lord. Remove the sin from our midst. Set ourselves apart for God's use. Be obedient to what he tells us to do. And then we can pray that God would restore us back to our first love and to the spiritual life that God has intended for us to have. So the accursed things were the things that God set apart and either devoted for special ceremonial use or to be destroyed. They were things that God said, I want these to be 
used for the, in the temple and the rest of this stuff, I want it destroyed. So it, it, it was all, you know, for God and God's use, however he saw fit. So before we pray for revival, we need to deal with the sin that's in our lives and remove the accursed things from among us ourselves. The things that God has told us not to touch. What has God told you not to do? We need to get rid of that out of our life and not to touch those things and to set, you know, set ourselves aside for his service. For you and me, the accursed things represents anything in our life that is contrary to the will of God, contrary to his word, and anything that brings disobedience and sin. So I just, I, you know, I just want us to, to understand this. To pray and beg God for revival, to come upon a backslidden and disobedient church is a waste of time and effort. You know, we got to get first things first. A move of religious activities could add numbers in our attendance, but God is really not interested unless the people come under the obedience and the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's when we come completely under him and under his authority, then, that, then our walk with God can be restored. God will restore what is broken. And he will make us whole again when those who are the family of God allow the Holy Spirit to change us and when we begin to live holy lives. Achan, whose name, by the way, means trouble, disobeyed what he knew to be God's will. By his own confession, he took some of the accursed things for himself, thinking that no one would know it. That it wouldn't have any impact on anybody. Nobody's going to know the difference. But in verse 15 of chapter 7, God calls ache and sin a disgraceful thing. And because of his sin, Israel was defeated at I. The first thing we should notice about ache and sin is that the Lord was angry, not just at Achan, but against all the children of Israel. It almost doesn't seem fair. But God held the nation responsible because Israel was one people and one family under God. When one member of the family of God broke covenant, the entire family's relationship with the Lord was broken. And today, even with the church, there's a similar bond that exists among believers and among God's church. We are the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is the head of the church. What we must recognize is that when one part of the body of Christ sins, the consequences extend beyond just that one part of the body. It goes to the entire body. When Achan sinned, 36 soldiers died because of hit that one man's sin. The Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Do you not know that a little leaven, leaven representing sin, do you not know that a little sin leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. A little leaven leavens the whole church. A little sin, and I'm not saying that we're to be perfect, we're not, but what we're talking about is unconfessed sin, unrepentant sin, sin that we just continue to, to want to live in, thinking we've got it hid and it's covered, nobody knows it's going to know the difference. This unconfessed, unrepented sin in the body of Christ will leaven the entire body if it's not dealt with. So this is serious business for our church. This is serious. That's why I think we've got to take this so serious is not that we got to live perfect and be perfect people, but we got to deal with our sin. We got to confess our sin. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, deal with it. Repent of it. Come before the Lord and get it out of the midst of your life. We must understand that as members of Christ's body, we're one unit. We're one family. God called this church from the very beginning to be a family. 
We're one family. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We belong to one another. We need one another. And what happens to one affects every one of us. So it's not just you. It's not just me. When I sin that it affects, it affects all of us. In verse 21 of chapter 7, we can see how Achan's sin progressed. This is how sin works. And it's so true. It says, number one, he saw. He began to look at the garment. Look at the silver. Look at the gold. It was like his focus became on, this, on these things. And then it says he coveted. And then it says he took. And then it says he died. And we know the wages of sin is death, right? James chapter 1, 14 and 15 illustrates this very truth. It says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. In other words, this is where Achan saw and he coveted. Then when desire was conceived, it brings birth to sin. He took. It wasn't just necessarily the looking at it that was a sin. It was the taking. Disobeying God. So he sinned. When it's full grown, it brings forth death. He died. The sin of Achan put the entire nation of Israel at risk of destruction. Likewise, the sin of one family member puts the entire church at risk. And again, I'm talking about unrepented sin, okay? God's solution to the problem was for them to find and admit to the sin and repent of the sin and to sanctify themselves. That word sanctified means to clean, to consecrate, to dedicate, to set apart, to be holy, and to vote oneself to the Lord. He's saying repent. Come before the Lord. Repent of your sin. Confess that sin to the Lord. Be changed. Allow the Holy Spirit to change you. And then, and then set yourself apart for God and his purpose. So each tribe or family needed to search their heart. They needed to purify their heart. They needed to repent. And they needed to get the sin out of the camp and present themselves to the Lord. Then when they had followed God's instruction in dealing with sin, then God's grace and forgiveness was extended again to the nation. If we truly want revival, and understanding that revival is a return of the relationship that God intended with his people, we must repent of sin, dedicate our life to the Lord for his divine use and purpose. We set ourselves apart for him. We must search our hearts. We must confess our sin. We must repent of our sin and set ourselves apart from the world and unto the Lord. Achan and his family were guilty. They were unrepentant and they, were, they died for their sin. Then the Bible says that God was no longer angry with Israel and their relationship was restored. It was revived. They experienced revival again. They went back from the place of not having walking in with the Lord and receiving his blessing. There was a revival that spread through the nation and they were revived back to the original plan that God had for his people. God will answer our prayer for revival when it goes along with a radical change of life and not before. There has to be change. For one to be saved, there has to be changed. For one to be revived, there has to be change. Church, it's important that we understand that God will not tolerate unconfessed sin among his people. He just will not, he won't be in the midst of it. However, in his great love, in his mercy, in his grace, he calls us to repentance and forgiveness so that our relationship with him can be revived. Before revival comes, we got to cleanse the temple. We got to come completely under the authority of our risen Lord and Savior once again. Then we can pray 
then we can ask God and expect true revival to follow. God is extending, I believe, an invitation for the Ark Church to come to an unknown place, a place we've never been before, a place we've never walked with with God. We've never walked, I don't think, we're the, in the place that God truly wants us to walk with him. It's a place of revival. It's a place of the restoration of God's intent for his bride. It's a place of his presence like we've never experienced before. It's a place that God intends for mankind and that, that is intended from the very beginning. And it's a place that we've never experienced before. But first, we've got to do like David did in Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. He cries out and he asks God to search us and know our heart. Try us and know our thoughts and see if there's any wicked thing, any wicked way in us and lead us to life everlasting. See, that's the place I believe we can start as a church. God search us try us see if there's any wicked ways in us reveal them to us Lord because we want to repent we want to come before you we want to change we want the power of the Holy Ghost to change us to bring conviction so when God reveals sin we're to repent before the Lord and get the sin out of our life it is then that we can walk with God as he intended so this is revival. I guess the question is, do we still want revival? You know, I mean, sometimes it's easier just to say, I wish God had sent revival and we'd see people coming in, people getting saved and people being changed, but no change in me. If we truly want revival, the change starts in me. It starts in you. It's repent. It's coming before the Lord and saying, God, search our hearts. Find if there's things that I don't even I'm aware of right now. Show me those things that are hindering that walk with you, that talk with you, that time that, that, that is separating me out of just what you want to do with your people and with me. I pray that I, I know this is where God is leading our house to right now. It's preparation for where God is wanting to take us as a people of God. Until, I, I, I mean, the I, only thing I can think of is eyes not seen or ears heard. What God wants to do, if we as the people of God will truly become his people, truly repent before the Lord, truly get the sin out of our camp, out of our midst, and truly give our hearts and lives to God, I, I don't think we'll have a problem seeing people saved because we're going to be witnesses of God in our everyday life out there, just wherever we go. We're going to have the light of God shining. on. We're going to be blessed. We're going to walk in victory after victory after everything the enemy begins to put in our path. If we'll seek the Lord, if we're walking with him, listening and obeying to the directions that God has given us, those enemies will fall one right after another. People's lives will be changed. People will be saved. People will be walking with the Lord. And that's what we're after. That's the true revival.